without any further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Gary uh, for a few brief words of welcome. Hey, thanks, Rachel. It's great to see everybody. I hope everybody's having a great day and thanks for joining us on this shop talk. I'm just going to welcome you on behalf of the board of directors of IPMI, and we've got a great panel lined up, and you'll hear more about that next. So who do I turn it over to? You're going to turn it back to me. Thank you, Gary. You. We're always happy to have you. Um, we have a number of members of our board of directors here today, so I do hope that you'll say hello to them in the chat as well. Um, I know we only have a short hour, and it's going to fly by. I'm going to pass it to Robert Farron, our moderator, to get us started. Thanks, Rachel. Um, and welcome to September's IPMI Shop Talk entitled Innovations at the Curb. Uh, my name is Robert Farron, and I'll be playing the role of moderator for today's discussion. Uh, before we get started, I want to thank my new employer, Kim Lee Horn, for giving me the opportunity and support to facilitate this discussion and get involved in all aspects of IPMI. Um, our core purpose at Kim Lee Horn is to provide an environment for our people to flourish. And one of our core values is to provide exceptional client service. And I can think of nothing better that exudes these two traits than to participate in this discussion with some amazing colleagues today. As we begin to the discussion, I wanna thank Alex, Brandy and Dylan for their time today to offer their thoughts and insights into curbside management. Cities are continually testing and piloting new technologies to more actively and dynamically manage the curb. These innovations are driven by an ever shifting demand profile at the curb along with the renewed emphasis on equity, sustainability, and access. Before we hear about the great things happening in Miami, Las Vegas, and Minneapolis, let's first start with some resources that are readily available for IPMI members and curbside practitioners. This shop talk is the culmination of three years of participation for my colleagues on the Research and Innovation Task Force. This time last year, our team uh, this time last year, our team published the first curbside management glossary of terms in the September 2021 edition of Parking Mobility. I want to thank the entire task force for their hard work on this great industry resource. There are over 40 terms defined in the glossary. That's purpose is to provide common terms and definitions related to practice of curbside management. So what exactly is curbside management? As defined in the glossary, curbside management is the development, implementation, management, and enforcement of policy, assets, and technology governing the uses that interact with the curb lane, curb space, or curbside. So with this definition in mind, let's get into the conversation. I'm gonna ask my colleagues that they introduce themselves um, as, they, as they start to talk about their most important goal that they're trying to achieve with their curbside management program. Alex, let's start with you. Hi everyone, thank you, Robert, and everyone who is participating with us today. So I'm Alex Argadine, I'm the CEO for the Miami Parking Authority. We manage and operate uh, all the municipal parking in the city of Miami. And uh, we have now increased our, our management to the county and the other municipalities that don't have a parking program. Um, and because the way we were established, we're able to do that. So um, it's been a good, you know, big success story for us to be able to grow and provide parking services for other cities. Um, every city is going through this. Um, I, I don't think curb management is a, a, a fad. I think it's, it's real and it's here. Um, I do see an increase of car usage um, here. I don't, I don't think the cars are decreasing uh, by any stretch of the imagination. And if we get rid of or start reducing gas cars and we have electric cars, we also have to have a place for them to charge. So no matter what, our curb is always gonna have um, a need um, for, for us to manage the parking for, for, for it. And so I think, um, I think one of the biggest challenges for us and that we're trying to achieve is how do we um, get into that transportation space where we're allowing for better traffic flow because of the way we're managing the curb, um, whether it's partial delivery or whether it's, you know, the Amazons or if it's a food, food delivery or anybody, you know, the, the mom and pops, not only the big, the big fish, but the little fish. Um, how do you get that established and how do you get them all to, to work in that space? I think education is a big part of this. And I think um, sometimes 
the pressure has to come from the top legislatively, um, which is what we don't have right now. And policy is going to have to drive this at some point, uh, because if not, I feel like we spin our wheels and, and sometimes we're not too at the top of, the, of that totem pole to be able to um, put these things in play. So I think us as parking, um, in the parking industry, we can only do the things that we can control, you know, manage the things that we can control. Um, and later in this conversation, Robert, I'll, I'll share with you what we have done in, in a certain part of our city that we're hoping will be a good test pilot for um, how we could better manage the curb. Thanks, Alex. Uh, you know, I, I think we're probably going to have more questions than answers at the end of this, but I also know that you're going to help help us answer some of those questions later on. So thank you. Um, let's go a little further west. Uh, Dylan, um, Minneapolis, can you talk a little bit about your goals around your curbside management program? Yeah, sure. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Dylan Freed. I'm with the City of Minneapolis Public Works and our Traffic and Parking Services Division. Uh, I manage our on-street parking systems and programs for the city. So um, our, our most important goal that we're trying to achieve with our, our curbside management program is really, you know, I thought about it, and it's truly to balance what are often uh, competing priorities within our city. Um, Minneapolis, it's, when I found this out, I, I thought it was really interesting. The city of Minneapolis, its peak population was actually back in 1950. We had a little over 500,000 people at that time. And even today, the most recent census, we're at like 425,000. And so we were really hit hard by, you know, the sub suburbanization uh, wave that was going on throughout the, the country at that time. Our metropolitan area has grown though. So we're at, you know, 3.7 million, I think, in our MSP, Minneapolis-St. Paul metropolitan area. So a lot of our infrastructure was built to accommodate commuter traffic and events throughout our city. But um, like a lot of other cities, we've seen a lot of densification over the past couple of years. Um, and then trying to retrofit our infrastructure to better, better accommodate biking, walking, transit, and uh, other modes of transportation. Uh, but then, of course, the conflict comes where the rubber meets the road there when our mode share realities of today kind of um, run up against our, our priorities and the, the vision of where we want to be for our mode share goals with our, our narrowed streets, reduced travel lanes, eliminating parking. We've done that in several corridors, uh, high profile corridors, and we have a bunch of different projects on the table right now where we're essentially eliminating parking lanes um, in, in lieu of travel uh, of transit lanes and, and other um, types of modes. And so finding ways to, to balance um, this increasing parking demand with the higher density and you know, the want to support the economic development within these business corridors, uh, but to balance that against where, our, where we wanna be as a city, where, where our policy objectives have been put out you know, that's what I think is of as our biggest challenge um, of our curbside management program right now. So. Thanks, Dylan. And I, th I think a lot of us can can sympathize whether you're in a city on a campus, corporate campus, healthcare facility, airport, you know, a lot of new policies coming out, whether it's about sustainability or equity or resiliency um, and not necessarily meeting the current demand that's occurring that you're seeing on a day to day basis and how we can kind of reconcile those two things. So thank you, Dylan. Um, let's go further west to Las Vegas. Um, and Brandy, why don't you talk a little bit about your goals around your curbside management program? I heard it's a cool 115 degrees out in Vegas today. You're on mute, man, uh, Brandy. Yeah, it's pretty close to 115. It's a, it's a bit warm, but we're hoping for better weather this weekend. Um, Las Vegas has, Obviously, we have curbside issues as well as everyone else. Most of our issues are centered around moving people, effectively moving people in and out of the city. Um, so our focus is really on your limos, taxis, Ubers, Lyfts, uh, getting people from place to place in the city. We've sort of figured out the, the goods and services piece of it. Um, and most of that stuff happens when the people are still in bed recovering from whatever festivities they had the morning before. Um, but emptying out garages during peak times and keeping the traffic flow moving has been a huge challenge for us since basically the day I started with the city 12 years ago and it's only gotten uh, more pronounced. So 
you know, on street parking meters, we knew that they were going to start going away as competing uses for the curb continue to happen. And that's bike lanes. It is bus stops. It's loading zones. It's, uh, you know, it's a lot of different things that are pushing meter parking off the street. So we have made a concerted effort to focus um, customer parking off the street wherever we can, because we knew that we were going to experience a loss in on-street parking. Um, so, you know, really what we're focusing on is, you know, is trying to keep the, the traffic flow moving. And there are certain areas in the city where it basically comes to a standstill unless we can, you know, put people there or put technology there. So we've been focused on trying and figuring out what actionable solutions we can put on the street. So, and that's in the parking industry, that's really, really difficult right now. There's a lot of ways you can gather data. You can spend millions of dollars putting up cameras and sensors and trying to figure out what your problem is, but it's hard to spend millions of dollars to try to solve it because the technology and solutions are still being developed. And that's really what our focus is, our focus is on right at the moment. Thanks, Brandy. And, and let's stick with you then and let's talk about um, you know, some exciting programs that, that you've been deploying in the curb management space. And, and before you get to that, what, what I like about these responses is I think we all were doing curb space management before it was cool. Um, <laughs> it, it was, it was parking demand management. And I, I like the fact that we've moved from the parking to the curb piece of it, because the reality is we've always been focused on more than just a single occupancy vehicle parking along the curb side. It's always been these other things. What I like is that the, the term curbside gives a more holistic view to what we've been doing, and that allows us to have those conversations both in the industry, but as well as with our transit operators or the delivery vehicles or the TNCs, property owners, et cetera. So, um, but I, I still remain, when people come to me and say, you know, what's this curbside management? Like, we, we've been doing this for years. It's just a new term. And now, and now let's have a conversation about it. So, uh, Brandy, t t um, talk to us about some of those some of those exciting projects you're working on in Vegas. Well, we have um, we have a failed project, we have a project that's successful, and we're scaling up. And then we have a cigar box project that is turns out to be the only way we can manage a certain part of the city. So. Um, that goes back to what I said earlier about, you know, the, the, the technology and solutions for some of these problems just don't exist yet. So we're trying to come up with a solution for, you know, whatever, wherever we can pull solutions from. So the failed project is not a technology failure. It's a failure of, um, it, it's, it's just something that isn't going to work. And that's basically what we did was we created an off street staging area for Uber and Lyft in some of our less busy garages in the downtown area. And, you know, at first we thought it was timing because we launched it just before COVID happened. And, um, and then after COVID, you know, there was an imbalance in supply and demand with drivers and people that wanted rides. So we thought that was it. Now that that's been solved, we still don't see many more than two or three drivers accessing these garages for which they can park for free, for which they have restrooms, they have Wi-Fi, they have... Um, a bunch of amenities in these garages and they're just not using it. And the technology works great. Um, they can get into the garages using Bluetooth and everything. It's a very well publicized program. Uber has been a great partner. They have pushed it out to their drivers, but they just don't use it. So we're actually, we're actually gonna pull the plug on that project because um, unless we can get there, there really isn't anything else that we feel that we can do or Uber can do to get the drivers to use it. So. That one is that one's going to go away, probably in the next couple of days. And the one that the one that is uh, a success is putting huge six foot kiosks in some of the peak in in one of the peak areas downtown where we were having problems with um, passenger loading and unloading with Uber and Lyft and the taxis because people would camp in those spaces. So, you know, it wasn't a matter of, we didn't know how to allocate the curb. We, we allocated it for active loading and unloading. So if you're not actively loading or unloading a passenger, we can issue a ticket right away. The problem was, is that nobody was reading the static signs. So they would just camp there and the whole, the, the whole zone would fail. So we took the next step and we put in huge kiosks that had advertising on one side, and then they had visual cues to each one of the parking spaces on the other side where it, with a countdown. 
So when a car pulled into the space, it would it would it shows a picture of the car and then starts a countdown timer. And that is enormously effective at getting drivers to move along so that it's it's a huge success and um, it will probably pay for itself with advertising revenues for the other side. So we have finalized the contract with that and we're actually gonna scale it to um, one other location right now and, and probably some other locations in the city in the future because it doesn't require that I staff somebody there to keep the curb clear. With the very big, very clear visual instructions, um, people, people are obeying the rules um, and that has been a huge success. And then the other solution where we pulled out the cigar box, we actually took a full-time parking enforcement officer and staffed a section of the curb. And they're only dedicated to that section of the curb. And that's the only way that we can keep that traffic lane moving. Um, there is no technology that we can put in there because it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a travel lane with a bus stop. And there are just so many visual cues to customers and Uber and Lyft drivers and taxi and limo drivers for them to stay and park there, that there isn't anything short of an aggressive enforcement presence in person that is, that is in any way effective at keeping the traffic flow moving. So basically we've taken three different approaches and we, you know, we, we take a look at a situation we have and if there is no technology, we'll keep at it until we find a solution that may not be technology-based. So that's I love, awesome. I love it, Brandy, and I love that you're sharing things that worked and things that didn't work. And that's you know it, you have to test things and pilot things. Um, so so kudos kudos to to all three of those examples, and the fact there's a gradient again. Technology is not going to solve anything. So um, that's um, it's good for folks to hear that. I think everyone jumps to we got to have some big shiny object. But um, thanks, Brandy. Alex, let's go back to Miami. Talking about pilots and tests and programs. Um, what are y'all cooking up down in Miami? So we also, since, since Brandy, I, I love that you had um, those three things to show, you know, there's things that don't work. And people always think like, oh, you guys put everything out, everything works, everything's shiny. No, it's not. It, it really isn't. And, you know, it's risks that I am allowed to take. And I, I do have a board that does support me on that. And, and you know, some we, we typically take, uh, you know, calculated risks, um, but this also goes to integration. So I we did a, a, a pilot which lasted, I don't know, upwards of three or four years, I guess. Um, and so it wasn't just a pilot of, of sensors. And um, it, it took a little bit to um, get that program going and get accurate information. I think what the failure there was the, the accuracy of the information that we were receiving. So us too, we had to pull resources out of our um, operations to be out there, do, do testing on the accuracy of what these sensors were giving us in order for us to um, calibrate uh, the sensors. And once we got them, yes, they would give us uh, occupancy and length of time but it wasn't connected to our payments. So it, I, I, I could not use that information only for using it to, to know, determine at the times that people, you know, was a heavier use of those, the, that curb. Um, and so, and the on-street spaces in that area. Um, so the failure here was the lack of integration with another vendor that we used to do our, you know, we do our payments with. Uh, because that then would have said, okay, that car in that space has, you know, overstayed, and now we can really send our enforcement to that area. Um, so overall, it, it was nice to see the occupancy, and um, and at the time there was not as many uh, tech, tech, the technology that can, you can roll out now did not exist then. I mean, we've had it for quite a quite some time. So you know, it was a nice idea at the time. It did give us information that we needed um, for that area, but it wasn't connected to the payment uh, of the cars. So it wasn't a complete project. And ultimately it didn't, it didn't do much for the, the decisions that we wanted to make moving forward. Um, and so we then uh, are piloting now with another company. It is a camera based, it's like a camera based sensor, right? And uh, we Pick the location that is interesting because Miami is very organic and it grows like a mushroom really quickly all of a sudden. And this was an area, it's called Midtown, and it is um, was established through a CDD. And um, it's 
pretty much 12 blocks, but some of the blocks are enormous. They're, you know, five acres big. So, I mean, it's, 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 it, it, it's just the way that the streets are. So it's a huge area. Um, and so in, in this area, we are putting cameras that we have seen and seen tested in other cities and they will guide the driver to where there's a parking space. It will also allow us to see what are the, what's the occupancy, the length of stay, and it will be tied to our payment system. So we will be able to gather a lot of information um, that we will then start managing the loading zones better in that area because people are just parking, they just park everywhere. There, are, there is a garage, uh, pu a public garage that people actually use, but people like to circle. And so this has become a very dense part of the city where it started being only retail and restaurant. And now there's a Trader Joe's, a Target, and I would say upwards of probably 2000 units of, of, of um, apartments. So it's become a livable little city within the city. And um, we had never seen, uh, the, during the pandemic, I think it was one of the places that bounced back the quickest uh, because people were working from their apartments and they had a place to go and the restaurants were open and the retail was open and you didn't have to leave anywhere. So you could stay within those 12 blocks. And so we are piloting there this technology that I'm hoping will give us a lot of information. It will allow the driver to be driving and see, okay, there's four spaces to the right. Let me go there as opposed to circling. And I think it will give us a lot more information on you know, the payments. We realize that although people, it's packed all the time, people take the most gamble in this area to not pay. And we don't have an enforcement that just sits there all day waiting to give someone a citation. So this is going to allow us more information to see where are the areas, are we not signing properly? It will allow us to make better decisions on the way we're rolling out our operations in, in, in this area and maybe roll this out in other parts of the city. Uh, we have really rolled out different pilots in different parts of the city. Uh, we've never done a pilot in the same place twice. Um, because everywhere in our city is, is different. Every every little area is like a nook that that um, people behave differently. And so we've learned a lot from those. I, I was actually talking to staff about this one. I really want to make a case study about it so that we could all learn from the things that we are good at and the things that we did not succeed um, with. So hopefully in the next uh, six months or so, uh, we'll be able to have a conversation again. I would love to provide the information of what we've learned from the pilot that we're doing now. That'd be great, Alex. It sounds like you're going to be looking at a Q1 Parking Mobility Magazine feature article. So just everyone to be on the lookout for that. Um, I, I love the fact that, again, you know, technology is changing so much. And I think a lot of folks are, you know, demanding certain solutions that, you know, this one piece technology has to solve all these things. And it, that doesn't have to be the case. Yeah. You know, certain technology can serve certain cases and then in certain areas. So looking at a defined area, kind of controlling for that space and then collecting data, um, that that's a pivot from I think a lot of folks that are like, I'm being for I'm I'm being pushed to, I need to find the perfect technology solution. I need to put that everywhere. And that is that's one tactic. Clearly the tactic of testing things and kind of going through an iterative process. Um, is something that you've employed and cert certainly uh, no, and, and definitely I'm Robert, one one thing that I, I, I credit to the suppliers. I think that where when we started testing, so you know vendors weren't as open to sharing their information and open APIs. I think that that has also changed, shifted a lot, and it allows us as users, um, municipality or universities or airports or whoever, to be able to have that flexibility of using several vendors and integrating, you know, into one system where we can you know, operate easier because what we want to see is everything in one place, right? We don't want to have to go to different places to get information. And I think um, the the vendors have much, you know, we're, they're playing much better in that space. Um, and so I'm grateful for that because it's allowed us to do these pilots. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thanks, Alex. Um, Dylan, let's go back to Minneapolis. What's going on, on the curbside? Yeah, so to, to take to to reference the before times a little bit here so going back pre-pandemic um minneapolis was really active we had a lot of support from our leadership to to you know try things out you know let's try some things out 
Uh, we were very active with the Transportation for America group. We were selected to be one of their pilot cities in 2020 to, we were likely gonna be doing some uh, freight optimization pilots with loading zones and, and cameras. Uh, we have we worked really hard on a, a PUDO pilot, uh, pickup drop off uh, pilot for TNCs in our busiest nightlife district. So we, we were just doing a lot of things around that. One, one thing we put a lot of work into back then too was building out this really beautiful curb map. We had unleashed some interns and, and they did our entire central business district and some of our other corridors where we had mapped all the different curb uses. And it was just this real beautiful map that was in ArcGIS and it got used in some national conferences. People were touting it up, this is great. Um, and then of course the pandemic hit and, and that changed everything for our city. You know, with, nobody was coming downtown. A lot of our, our problems basically went away, you know, temporarily, other than whipping up a program for restaurant pickup. That was about the only thing we really had worked on there. But we, we kind of circled the wagons and thought about, you know, what, what are we actually trying to use this for? Our curb map was out of date, on, you know, the day that it was made essentially, because we didn't have a plan in place for how to to maintain and, and update it. And a lot of there's a lot of information on there that we didn't really have a compelling reason to keep updated and to use. And so we put a lot of work into um, just generally digitizing a lot of our records. A lot of cities love to have stacks like I have behind my shoulder here of, of papers um, in file cabinets. So we've done a lot of work to, to digitize our records around what's on our curb now and to actually translate that into geospatial information uh, via G GIS systems. You know, there's the adage, you can't measure what you can't, um, you can't manage what you can't measure. And so we have, in, in going through this process of doing this, you know, we found ways, we kind of started with our metered parking program. You know, that's a money-making thing. We had a lot of rich information. And so we found like a, a, a set of um, visualizations we put together both uh, annually and monthly now to kind of represent what our utilization is in different areas of the city, you know, what our app versus pay station utilization is. So we're finding compelling reasons to use the, the, the information that we have put together um, for, you know, the geographical orientation of stuff. And this year we, we had a, we're, we're still working on a project to, um, to build out a, a, a digital map, a digital curb map of all of our loading zones in the city. And so not, we're not just having it be pretty lines on paper anymore. We're actually associating that with the information about why those zones are there. Um, in Minneapolis, you have, you're supposed to pay for an adjacent loading zone. And so we're identifying like who's paying for it, where like we have the original documents associated with that. So we can just click on that and see you know, uh, interns scanning documents older than they were all summer uh, to get them onto the system that we've created. And so we're finding these real world uses and operational uses for a lot of the information we're, that we've built into this um, curb map that, that we're slowly assembling. And, you know, we're identifying ones that nobody knows why they're there. There's a lot of them that we identify that have been there for 30, you know, 20, 30 years that the original re requester of the zone has long since been out of business or moved on. So it's really helping us to more efficiently allocate our curb space. And it's kind of informing what we're working on for our next steps in, uh, in our curb management journey, if you will. Uh, we're working to, to develop a formal curb use policy for our city right now that um, it'll kind of stand alongside like our street design guide and our um, vision zero policy. Um, and as you know, the first step would be developing that and then the next step would be implementation of that. So we're also looking to how can we gather information about our zones right now we have payment information about the um, about the meters that's pretty rich that we can use but we have very little information about how our our loading zones are actually used other than complaints from the police who have to deal with pudos at late at night right so. Um, looking at some options, exploring options to, to gather information from those, whether it be via camera or, or other sources to, and then just trying to, to have all the information we need when we truly want to implement and scale up some of the, the policies as we work through development of them. Thanks, Dylan. Um, 
I like the term journey you used. Everyone's on their current management journey. And we had put out a survey, the Research and Innovation Task Force, a couple of years ago, kind of asking folks to respond what they do in terms of curb space management. And a lot of folks said they didn't do anything, but then we got answers about, well, we put up signs, we have permit programs, and I think everyone has their own kind of definition of what they think curbside management should look like. And there are, again, there's kind of gradients along the journey. Um, and I think it's key, as you said, in defining what you have out there. There are so many legacy policies that are scattershot throughout our cities and on our campuses that were put in because of some request. Um, and getting those all digital and then starting to go through the process, right? Because usually it's the loud person, it's the, it's the corner house, it's the, you know, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. No, actually we have a process now. We're going to go through that process and we're going to define things a certain way and to mitigate what you're finding in kind of your archaeological dig, which is yeah, it was, all these it was kind of things around the city. It was like the least sexy answer ever to what are you most excited about in your city? It's like, hey, we're translating our paper files to digital files. Yay. <laughs> it's a solid foundation from with then to, you know, conquer your curb space, your curb space in Minneapolis. Yeah. I love it. Um, Brandy, um, I want to go back to you. You talked a little bit about some of the technology you put out there. Can you talk a little bit more about any kind of limitations or challenges that you've had to overcome as you've kind of, as you've looked at deploying technology and as you've looked back and said, we did it this way, may we do it differently? Or as we maybe scale up, we would do things differently? Um, you know, it's really hard to answer that question, mostly because a lot of this stuff had happened during the pandemic. So, you know, we put out, a t you know, probably about a million dollars worth of technology, and then we couldn't really use it, and we couldn't test it very well because there were no parkers um, and no traffic downtown. So it turned into really, really long pilot programs to test these technologies, mostly because we didn't have the volume that we needed to be able to put it through its paces and to measure it. And we also didn't have, we didn't have measurements prior to putting these, you know, putting these things in place, right? So I get asked a lot, well, how did, you know, did it solve things? What was, you know, how do you know it worked? And, you know, it's kind of a lame answer because I mean, I, you know, basically I say, well, traffic moves. I don't know what it was like before because we didn't measure it. I just know it was a mess. So those are my statistics and that's all I got. <laughs> um, so making sure you have good measurements before you start or, you know, understanding what you need to measure so that you can determine what success is. And also realizing that what may be successful about it may not be what you measured to start with, right? So it's not all gonna be numbers that's gonna tell you whether or not a technology works because things are gonna come up that you didn't anticipate. I've been getting a lot of folks in the conversation early, right? We had a similar situation in Columbus where when we put in our, our pilot, um, we were, what, four months away from the shutdown. Of course, we didn't know that at the time. Um, so our goals changed, but we didn't collect data on the front end that supported those new goals. Now, would we have ever, I, I don't know, but we, we kind of had a little tunnel vision as to what we were trying to do with that pilot. And if we had brought more folks in, we probably would have gathered some other data sets or maybe mm -hmm. some atypical data sets that could have supported those goals or at least, a little, at least looked a little more globally at things. So that's a great point. Um, thank you, Brandy. Um, Alex, you want to talk about kind of a little more about um, your pilot and then, you know, some of the, maybe the challenges you faced around partnership, um, you know, just, just trying to scale things and getting people on board? Sure. I, I think it goes back to what I had commented before. I think part of the... Uh, it, there's a lot of challenges that we face as, as the parking, we're, we're the parking department. And if we want to put cameras, there's FPNL, they're the ones that run all the electrical uh, for the city. And sometimes you have to deal with them and it could take you months to get a permit for the, you to access their poles. Um, the city is not too far from that either. So I think is, is getting in that space of we do provide a, a, a solution that everyone needs in order for traffic to flow better, to help transportation, to help everyone who's trying to fight for a space in the curb. So we need to be at the table when the discussions are being had and not so much in the aftermath, right? And I, I think that that's driven by policy. Um, so I think the challenges have been more of that. And 
when we had a ton of vendors that we were working with and then we all wanted them to integrate and they're like, no, we're not doing that. And, and so that became challenging um, because to get to the end game, we need them to be able to, to speak to each other or to speak to whoever is going to be holding that, that information, right? Um, I think that that has forced us and, and I'm proud of what we've been able to do internally. There's a lot of uh, processes what, that we have developed internally where um, our IT department has been the ones that are holding the information from our vendors. And I think vendors are more comfortable with that to a certain extent. And so it's been a lot of work on our end, but uh, we are getting real-time information directly. And we've been able to do that because I have the resources to do that. Not everyone has those resources. And so when I gave kudos to the vendors, it's because there's a lot of vendors that have realized, okay, well, it, listen, in this space, either we work together or there's people who are demanding and there are RFPs out there that demand that you have an open API, right? And I think in the future to have digital policy, we're going to be seeing a lot more of that. Um, where we want to have that data because that data is what's going to allow us back to what Brandy's saying and, and the same thing as Dylan, we, we need that information. It's not to, I'm not selling the information. For me, it's about that data is going to help me make my next decision on what I'm going to be rolling out, where I need my operations to be, where my enforcement needs to go. Um, do I need this many people? Do I need to scatter? Do I need to, you know, increase my, my operations, you know, as it relates to time, you know, 20, we are, we are 24 seven city, um, um, maybe we think we are and we really are not, uh, but the data is the one that's going to drive that, right? Um, I think a lot of us are data rich and um, information poor. So we have a lot of data, but nobody's looking at it. And uh, we have started to focus. I have an actual body, a person that is now responsible for that. And it's, it's incredible the amount of information that our, um, our equipment does provide us and our payment platforms provide us. And that has allowed us to make better informed decisions. And I think we pick Midtown because we know that just based on an LPR system, we know that we are 95% of the time, the spaces are filled and I'm getting like a 60, 65% payment. And we, we, we don't even pick up on that. And, we, and we're making revenue in that area, in the area I'm telling you, in Midtown. And so how, how are we missing that other you know, 40% or 35% of payments. And we are going, I'm hoping that through technology, I'll be able to, and the integration of the, the cameras and the payment platform, uh, be, you know, be able to, to get better information so that I can see what is happening and determine, do I need more signage? Are people just not seeing that they have to pay? Uh, do I have to break up the locations into smaller bytes? Right now, I may have a location number for the entire zone. Maybe I have to break it down into smaller zones so that I can gather better information. This is what this information is going to tell me. And then I'm going to be able to then react and, and change the structure of how I'm operating in that site. Um, so I, I think the challenges do stem from the top sometimes. I, I think I want to do demand pricing. Well, I can't do demand pricing unless I have it as part of my ordinance, my rate ordinance. And you go into, you know, the, you know, you go into the, um, into our commissioner's office and you tell them, listen, I, I want you to do demand pricing and I'm going to charge $6 an hour when it's peak time and they're going to laugh in my face. So I need to have that data to prove to them, this is why we're doing this. We got to move people out of the street into the garages. And this is the only way we're going to do that. Um, so it's a lot of education, I think. Um, I think that that is the part that I struggle with the most sometimes is is everything is a dollar sign but they don't realize how we play such an uh, uh, an important part of making things flow better uh, within the city everybody wants to find a solution but ultimately i think parking will be able to provide a lot of that i think in our space we are providing a lot more technology than even transportation um you know my counterpart here is is the county and um we provide them with a lot of information that they need to have better routes and um, to have a better system. And so I think a lot of the light is shining on us to see how we succeed and see how we can integrate uh, with them for the future to provide a better uh, you know, access to the curb and, and flow of, of traffic. So you know, I think all of us struggle a little bit with that, Robert, with, with the policy makers and, and the things that we need to be successful. 
Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we can talk about technology and data collection and best practices all day long, but I know quite a few of us are at varying levels restricted by ordinances and rules and other other things that get into politics and other things that um, are sometimes hard to rationalize. So, um, you know, understanding those pitfalls and kind of understanding where those landmines are probably half the battle in terms of moving, moving along and moving along in the journey. I see some questions in the chat. Um, we're going to have some time for some kind of rapid fire. I'm going to read those off um, to Alex, Brandy, and Dylan as we get toward the end. Uh, but Dylan, I want to pivot to you. Um, can you talk about, you talked a little bit earlier about how Minneapolis has evolved, like a lot, like a lot of cities. Um, can you talk about how, you know, some external forces, some, some larger city policies um, have affected how you and your team have, um, have been reacting to and managing, managing curbside demand? Yeah, absolutely. So, so one of one of the main things to, to get across on this is, you know, I think a lot of cities are increasing their density, right? Minneapolis has adopted some very aggressive policies to um, to combat rising housing prices and to to respond to equity concerns throughout our city, our well documented equity concerns. Um, and uh, one of the main things we've done it was about. 12 years ago now, we eliminated off-street parking minimums in our downtown, so, so no developments in our central business district have been required to build any parking at all in our downtown for the past 12 years. About seven years ago, we eliminated parking minimums and high-frequency transit corridors throughout our whole city, and we've had two uh, major light rail projects, um, and so there's been unprecedented transit-oriented development along those nodes. And it was just last year we eliminated parking minimums citywide. So even though last year we eliminated them citywide, we're already experiencing the development effects of, of when buildings don't build one for one parking with the, their new development. Now, I don't, I'm not trying to, to have this be a cautionary tale by any means. I, I really support the elimination of parking minimums. It's just that you know, it's a it's an absolute reality that we get calls on a near weekly basis from people in apartments who say my apartment building is full. What am I supposed to do about my street parking? And so um, and so just the increasing density throughout our city and the policies around um, parking and what off street parking needs to be constructed has been has had a major impact in what we do in on street parking. We also eliminated single family zoning citywide so you can have a triplex or a granny house. Um, in your backyard at, at any house in the city uh, now. So that combined with our aggressive policies around encouraging alternative modes of transportation. I, for one, am a bike commuter, year round bike commuter. So I benefit from one of the best bike networks in the nation. Uh, so we're just like a lot of cities though, we're re putting in bike lanes, repurposing travel lanes to, to transit. And so, I think one of the themes I've been hearing from, from Alex was that, you know, the parking professionals are not always at the table when some of these decisions are being made. And we've been kind of left to, you know, we were thinking about it all along, but we've we missed some opportunities, I think, to, to have some talk about some larger scale parking reforms that would go hand in hand with on-street parking reforms that would go hand in hand with some of the off-street parking reforms and other like people, the politicians love to celebrate, you know, um, encouraging alternative modes of transportation and hey, we're keeping housing costs down by eliminating parking minimums. But if we could have gotten a little more support or been at that at that same table or at that same event to tout up, hey, we're reforming how we do our residential permit program or hey, we're expanding some metered areas to support transit operations, it, it would have been kind of helpful. And so that's one thing we're, we're we're kind of playing a little catch up on uh, just because we're, like I said, we're already experiencing a lot of the effects of what this densification are. So. Um, there are a lot of cities that can share, share in that, share in that tale for sure. Um, and, you know, again, it goes back to legislative allowances and, and trying to get in those conversations on the front end, or at least making people aware that if, you know, if you do this, this is going to happen and that's okay, but then we have to have tools to react. So, Again, we can pilot in technology and all kinds of fun things or have cigar boxes out there, everything. But if we don't have the ability to kind of scale those things, um, we will continue to have challenges. So um, Dylan, I'm gonna stick with you here. We're gonna have lightning round kind of parting shots. And then if we have 
uh, time. We have a couple questions coming in. Um, so for you, Dylan, for Minneapolis, for your program, for the industry overall, um, what do you believe is next? What, what should listeners lean into as they come away from this conversation um, and continue their, their, as you put it, curbside management journey? Yeah, one of the things I've referenced before, and I think a lot of people reference in parking around this curb, around curb spaces, you, you can't manage what you can't measure. And so whether it's some sort of set like physical sensors or video sensors, finding ways to actually quantify um, what's happening around your loading space is kind of one of the, the horizon challenges that, that we're seeing in Minneapolis. And it's not just, you know, it's easy to put up a camera or a sensor where you know a loading zone is located, but a lot of the loading is taking place not at those zones. And so finding methods to determine where some of the informal uh, loading is taking place. You know, we've had done street reconstruction projects and said, hey, we don't need loading space by this because there's no loading zones there. So we eliminate the parking lane. The next thing I know, I have a full block of trucks parked outside our theater, historic theater district loading in set pieces because nobody had accounted for that and, and knew that it was happening. So I think finding ways to, to quantify that and understanding where it's happening um, is going to be key. Thanks, Dylan. That's where, I mean, our, as Alex uh, put it earlier, you know, having the partnership with the vendor community and, and how much technology has just come so far and that folks are, are partnering together and sharing data uh, that's going to be key to that data collection effort to figure out how we can all be smarter about where we put zones and 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 just generally how we allocate the curb space. So, thanks, Dylan. Um, Brandy, what's next in Vegas? Yeah, I figured it out that time. I was still muted. <laughs> Sorry. Um, we're just going to keep on, you know, sort of reacting to the needs as they as they as they come up, um, you know, we're not going to be a big fan of trying to solve problems before we have them. We're going to focus on the problems that we have. Um, it, you know, it also some things that we realized as we were going through some of the stuff that some of these solutions are enormously expensive. Um, you know, those six foot kiosks that we put in it, it, like Alex, it took a lot of permitting, a lot of involvement from different departments and a lot of infrastructure to put in to make those work. So, you know, we're fortunate that we were able to get revenue from advertising on the way back. And by the way, the cigar box operation with the enforcement officer, um, that one shift 40 hours a week is on track to generate over $300,000 in citation revenue just this year um, because it's so busy. So we're finding ways to pay for the infrastructure. Um, maybe not maybe not the best ways, but you know, it you do have to keep in mind that some of this stuff costs a whole lot of money and you have to figure out, you know, what, what is most cost effective and what's going to actually be effective. And I would also like to put in a plug for Dylan, um, digitizing your parking records and your curb restrictions is so important and pretty much nobody has done it. It is so hard to do that. And a lot of times it, cha it takes ordinance changes because most of the ordinances for putting in curb restrictions require you to put required to be on paper and not on maps. And we're not gonna get very far with a lot of these initiatives unless we can digitize that kind of stuff. So yay, Dylan. <laughs> we're rooting Thanks. for you, Dylan. <laughs> we're rooting for your success here. Absolutely. Thanks, Brandy. Alex, what's next? Digital policy. I think digital policy is next. Um, it's something that has been in the forefront for us. Um, I just feel like sometimes we're like the smaller three-headed monsters here. And um, I think the little guy is gonna have to take reign at some point and, um, and push through and, 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 and maybe be the first ones to, to, to put forth the digital policy by which you know, vendors will have to access um, the policy and be open to knowing that the curb is going to be um, the, the instructions or how you behave at the curb has to do with you having access to digital policy, right? And, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a big step. Um, it's not an easy feat. Um, people are doing it, you know, I know LA did it with their scooters. 
Um, on a smaller scale, I have electric, you know, mopeds here that I may do it with, and they're open to doing it. I, I may just do it to see how it works, you know. And like I said, in the smaller setting, something that I know I can control. Um, but ultimately, my ultimate goal is to have parcel delivery, which is it's become the biggest challenge for us. Um, read through this digital policy, and I know it's 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 big, but if we always say it's big and it's not, and it's it's difficult, we're never going to overcome it, right? And so I think we have to be at the table with them. They have come to the table. I have to say, Amazon is uh, the organization that's talking the most to us about maybe doing something with them. That'd be cool if I could even get that far. Um, I know it's little it's little it's little victories, right? And so I think um, I I don't know how else we're going to be able to manage that entire curb um, the way we want to like visualize it. I just need to put it in play. And, 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 I, and I think we have to, and I don't mind being the guinea pig to, to try to take this on, but it is a small group of people that have to take this on um, and it has to become their priority. Uh, I got to shift what they do here to, to now make this work. And I'm hoping I could do something like that, that then we could, you know, that, that everyone else could, could copy or, or can take our, our, again, what we have learned from the experience and apply it uh, to their cities. Absolutely, Alex. And, and so, you know, you talk about digitize, everyone talked about digitizing. And, and of course we talked about COVID. We talked about COVID being this, this seismic shift for us. And we all kind of went back and we did some different things, but overall we looked at efficiencies and reacting to changing demands of the curb. And the fact that the customer now is using digital tools a lot more. You know, COVID was that accelerator. Um, I want to pivot to a. Uh, there was a, at least one question around programs that were stood up during COVID, and the example here was you know pick up and drop off for restaurants. Just more holistically, and I'll start. Um, I'll stay with you, Alex. Is there anything you implemented during COVID that you've now turned into? Because I think I don't know if we're ever post COVID, but I think we're probably as post as we're going to be, at least in this moment in time. Is there anything that you implemented during COVID that now you said it's not a COVID program, it is now a program ongoing? Yeah, um, uh, food drop off and pickup became a huge uh, program for us. Um, and I think for a lot of cities where people wanted to come and, you know, you, we established uh, 10, 15 minute, you know, drop off and pickup zones. And those have remained and they've been very successful because I don't think that that has gone away, even, you know, and Florida has been, I don't think we were ever closed for COVID. Um, and, and even yet, we, we still have the drop off and pickups and it's been very successful and I think it, it helped the restaurants get on their feet. Um, we did have street cafes that opened, so we started using a lot of the parking spaces for cafes. Um, but that was free and um, that lasted for well over two years, two and a half years. And now um, that has significantly dropped because we are charging for the spaces now and the city's charging for their permits, et cetera. And so those have uh, eliminated themselves, but there are still a few that are, are using the space for the restaurants and it's been a very successful program. So those are the two things that we are, are still seeing that um, came out of COVID. Thanks, Alex. Brandy, anything that stuck through COVID? Um, yeah, one thing, and that's uh, we rolled out being able to pay at meters in parking garages using a QR code without an app. Uh, we rolled that out during COVID, and that is now actually 75% of all of our mobile transactions, um, which granted in Las Vegas, nobody can figure out why nobody wants to use an app, but they don't. Um, however, of the few that do, 75% of them prefer to use a QR code and not download an app. So that kind of stuck. Our street side cafe, you know, using parking spaces for that has not stuck. And we have tried to encourage it to continue. We don't charge, uh, but the restaurants have just decided that's not something that they want to continue to do, maybe because it's really, really hot uh three or four months out of the year i don't have any idea but there are some cities like san diego and um other cities where it really took off and it's probably going to stay just not here so yep qr Got codes it. that's what's stuck i love it that's that's a huge percentage that's awesome dylan so wait let me clarify 75 percent of mobile transactions which is only 10 percent of total <laughs> so you're only talking like maybe four or five or six percent it's good to have options for customers. I like it, regardless. <laughs> yeah. So we we whipped up our uh, 
you know, just like most cities, we whipped up our short-term pickup drop-off program for restaurants. That was a free program for them. We, we did end that completely back, I think, in June of 2021. We were seeing a lot of abuse of it where, you know, there'd be, their food truck was parked in that space like overnight or uh, during off hours or their delivery drivers would be there for a half hour at a time. A lot of them were setting up, you know, for our customers only information on them. So we, we did end that. We do get a lot of requests for them though. So I think there may be some version of that that does come back as we develop our, our broader Kirby's policy. Um, Minneapolis is dense for, for a, a Midwest city, but we're still not that dense compared to some of the coastal cities. So outdoor dining was huge for us here. People get uh, the fever to be outside in Minnesota, but most of our expansion of premise were either on sidewalks or adjacent parking lots. So we didn't really have that much uh, parking lane outdoor dining. We want that in our city. So we're, we're dropping the price down for permits on that and, and having it be more of a formal program, but that's kind of, that was in the works pre-COVID as well. I guess one of the other things to that we're really working on it kind of in response to with the new normal is in our central business district, relaxing a lot of our time limits and, and getting our pricing right. Because we, you know, we didn't want to rush to, to change a lot of that in COVID, but now as we're settling in and saying, yeah, we're just not going to have the business day demand for parking. So we, we are kind of altering a lot of that around our meter parking and our CBD as well. But our, our neighborhoods that are the restaurant and, and retail corridors are just are over 100% of what they were before. So a lot, it's just kind of the world turned on its head, right? So yeah, central absolutely. business district is not the focus of demand anymore. Uh, and I don't think it will be anytime in the next five years. So. Thanks, Dylan. Um, that was a great way to end. Um, I want to thank Alex and Brandy and Dylan for their time today and offering their perspectives from Miami, Las Vegas, and Minneapolis. I want to thank the IPMI staff uh, for creating this space for us to talk about uh, curb space management, innovations in curb space management, um, and to all of you for taking the time and offering your questions and thoughts. Uh, with that, I'm going to pass it off to Rachel to close us out. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Again, I'm going to echo that to all of the thanks for all of you for making time and to our panelists in particular and Robert. Um, this is the kind of conversation we want to have in Fort Worth. Um, in case you missed the email, um, the call for presentations is open. This is exactly the kind of stuff we need to be talking about. Uh, we want to hear more from you. Um, we actually have a new speaker submission guide too. Kenny's going to share the links to these things in the chat for you. But again, you have them in your email. You can always find me. Um, call is open and a new submission guide will tell you just how to go about it. And next week, if you want to stay tuned, we have some advice from our conference program task force reviewers who will tell you just how to do a session that's going to get selected, hopefully. Um, we also have our call for awards that starts this week as well that runs through November. So a couple of touch points for you to stay involved, stay engaged. We have a frontline next week. We have a webinar next week on electric vehicles. Uh, we do try to offer topics that are of interest. If there are other things you wanna hear about, you know where to find me, Sean the board, please let us know. Um, finally, thank you just so much for sharing your time, your expertise with us today. Let's keep the conversation going. Have a great rest of your day.